All right. Welcome back, everybody. Right now we have Dr. Adria Perez Rovira as a senior research scientist from Down. Take it away. Thank you very much for that. So, uh, as our colleague was, was saying, I'm Adria Perez Rovira. I'm a research scientist at, at Down, and today I'm going to talk about how we use machine learning solutions uh, to, to, for verification purposes, to, to prove that you are who you claim to be when you go online shopping or you access your bank account or things like that. So first of all, how, obviously, how do we, how can you prove that it, it is you who, you're, who are you claiming to be? There are three ways. The first one is by using something that you know and that's the very familiar passwords, pin numbers, and how many times you knock on this secret club, or anything that you, it's a specific knowledge that, that you have and nobody else is supposed to have. Alternatively, it can be something that uh, you have, something in your possession, so like uh, tokens, or the bank card, the keys of your house, or, or um, things like that, your mobile phone as well. Like a lot of times, you know, when you log in, you have to check on factor authentication, you get a push notification, and what you're doing is you're showing your identity because you're the owner of that phone. And finally, there's a third way that it's uh, something you are, and that's uh, biometrics, and that's what I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to talk. And that can be a face verification, fingerprint, uh, the one you're very familiar with on your mobile phones to unlock it, voice, and there's a, there's a lot more um, examples here. So going through the, the three of them, the first one is uh, something uh, you know, and we are all very familiar with all these scenarios of like, you have three attempts left, you know, what's the pin number? Um, last time I was in Belgrade, I lost my credit card, I had a second card, and I remember how much I panicked after my second failure on the pin number. Fortunately, the third one was the correct one, so I managed to survive, but it's not the most convenient um, um, experience. Models made the name, luckily, um, that's not very common anymore. And by well, you, you can see how happy he is, you know, passwords are not the most convenient thing. Um, there's this story of uh, Visa, you know, Visa is a very big player in authentication, as you can imagine. And they introduced in 2015, I think it was, uh, verified by Visa. So basically, your um, average um, merchant shop, like you sell online, and instead of like, having to handle all this authentication, uh, Visa came with an API, you connect to the API, so the, the customer on the website is shown this screen, and then he has to, to put this password that it's linked to the, his Visa account, and then a Visa um, guarantees fraud. So the merchant uh, was, uh, didn't have to worry about fraud or anything like that, so everybody was very happy. However, they realized that between 30 and 40% of users of this, when they saw this screen, they didn't complete the purchase. Like they didn't know their password, they didn't know what was going on, you know, what, what's this website, and that's a lot of money, a lot of revenue lost by Visa and by all the merchants. Um, things escalated, internet being internet. Um, it's not only like, you know, it was a loss, loss, um, a loss opportunity of, of, of sales, um, a lot of people uh, got their bank card uh, locked. Um, uh, so they had, you know, to complain on Twitter because that's what we do. And, uh, you know, you can see that uh, the banks were saying like, you know, yeah, we know this, this we had millions of tweets like this, please ring this phone number, you know, um, and we will unblock your, your bank uh, car. So you're increasing um, the traffic to your call center. This is more expenses and this is not good for anyone. And again, internet being internet never disappoints. Aaron, a lovely chap, uh, he will happily do jail time in order to strangle the prick who invented Verify by Visa. So you can see this wasn't go working very well. So, um, so in summary, cons of uh, passwords and on, on things you know, it's easy to forget. It's easy to steal. Like um, I'm, I'm a computer scientist, I try to be conscious of my own account, but if I, have, if I go to I have been pound, I've been pound twice. It's not my fault. Um, I don't remember which website it was. I, I hope it was something that it's not too embarrassing to confess. But, uh, but like, can you imagine my mother's email? How many times have been pound? You know, I, I didn't check because I didn't want to, to get too disappointed. Um, so in summary, it's inconvenient. Um, pros. Well, it's super easy to implement. You know, you compare one string to one string. If it's the same one, you're in. If 
get a little bit better, you, you, com you compare a hash string against a hash string. Still, it's not a huge effort for a programmer um, um, to implement this. Second one is something uh, you have. So as I was saying earlier, it can be the keys, it can be uh, your, your um, bank card, it can be those uh, tiny uh, tokens of, of FOPs, somebody called them. Um, well, cons, you have to carry them. Like you have them, you have them, you, ha you need to have them constantly. Like, you know, so nowadays you're carrying your phone, you're carrying your keys, you're, you're carrying like, you know, your, your recyclable cup because there's no plastic cups. You know, everything you need to carry more and more things. This is not convenient. If you get lost and you don't have your, your things, you will not be able to pay. It can be lost or stolen. It's not that, that hard. You know, I had this uh, initial story where I, my first night in Belgrade, I lost my card. Uh, it can be duplicated, especially if you go to certain countries. It's, it's quite common. Pros. Again, it's easy. It's not as easy to implement as a password check, but it's not that complicated. It's easy, let's, let's say, to, imp to implement. And finally, something you are, as I was saying, this is uh, biometrics. Uh, there's a lot of types of biometrics. There's two big families. One is uh, physiological biometrics, and it's probably what you're most familiar with. And that's what you are. So uh, biometrics comes from uh, life and measurement. So, so you measure parts of the body. So this is the com some examples. This is not a complete list at all. Fingerprints, like you, you, most of you might use them for uh, to unlock your phone face recognition, iris recognition. This is a retina. This is the back part of the eye. This has very particular veins and in specific ways. And you can recognize people with that um, quite efficiently. Uh, you've seen a lot in the movies, especially like 10, 15 years ago, they put the eye. That's, that's what they are looking more than the iris because it's much harder to tamper. You know, like you can put a contact lens and trick some, something, but like you're not going to open your eye and put extra veins to uh, to, to, to just get access. Well, maybe some people do it. There are some very esoteric uh, other um, forms of uh, physiological biometrics. This is like some glasses that you put on, on, on your head and it just vibrates, like it sends like an ultrasound and it measures the wave through the skull in a way to measure how the, the, the physical properties of your bones in the head. So that's also not very practical, I would say, but you know, this is more experimental. Um, but you know, there's a lot of things like that. There's like you know, um, also like we, we might you might be familiar with like um, the the lines on the ha on the hand, um, and anything. You know, you, you can measure anything. Um, that it's the key here is it has to be unique. So it has to be unique to you somehow, and it has to be constant because it changes constantly. Like you know, you're not gonna be the same person than a year ago. You will have to re-enroll again. It's a bit of a pain. And the, the, the mother of all them is the DNA. Like, this is the, the final proof it's you. It, it could be your twin, actually, but, uh, but that's, um, that's what they use to, to prove the identity of, of, of dead people, for instance, or, or terrorists. Like, I think Osama bin Laden, they, they took DNA samples and iris as well. They put an, uh, a scanner on the iris, and that way they were sure it was him. And then the second family is uh, behavioral biometrics. These are um, some of my pet favorites. I'm not going to talk too much, but I just I wanted to mention because it's really interesting work on this. And the most uh, common or the most the one you might be more familiar is signatures. Like in the old days, um, I heard the stories that people will sign checks as a way to prove it was them giving authority to the bank to um, to, to, to make the payment. And the thing of behavioral biometrics is like, they don't measure what you are. They measure how you do things. So they measure how you write your name in the signature. But in the same way that you're doing the signature, you could do it with a keyboard. Like every single of us has a particular cadence of, of how you type things. And like using, a, for instance, your own email, you can with like more than 95% accuracy, I can tell you, or some algorithms can tell you, if it's you who is typing that email or not. So those are very interesting uh, types of um, biometrics because they are completely invisible to you. Imagine you're typing your password, which we already agree is bad, but imagine that for a second. You can have um, dual factor authentication because you're, having, uh, you're typing something you know, and at the same time you're typing in a way that it's unique to you and you can be automatically authenticated without you even noticing that the bank has this technology. 
or the bank or whoever. You can also measure how people swipe with uh, certain invisible challenges that some Israeli company has. You can measure how people hold their phone and how they swipe. You know, everyone has certain particularities. You can measure how people walk. I remember once I was in the um, in Camp Nou in Barcelona. I'm from Barcelona, watching in the to the players, but that's a massive stadium. And uh, I could, I put very tiny players at the bottom. And I remember asking my father, like, how do you know this is a uh, Stoikov or whoever it was? I'm like, look how he walks. You know, you, you couldn't see the number, but just by the way he moves. Uh, it, my father, I, I had no idea. Um, he could recognize that, that person inside a small sample, obviously. But, uh. so, so, so as I was saying, um, biometrics, sorry, I, 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 I ramble a bit. But uh, again, a summary like before. So the cons of biometrics is that some modalities require specialized sensor. If you want to prove your identity through your fingertips, you need a sensor that reads that. So uh, this can be bad because it's an, extra it's an extra sensory, extra hardware, or it can, be bo it can be good. If you're Samsung and you want to distinguish yourself from someone else, you can add an iris scanner, as they did in 2017, that didn't work very well, but you can do this kind of stuff. It's much harder to implement. You usually will end using machine learning, or even if it's not machine learning, some very sophisticated techniques, or at least much more sophisticated than comparing strings. And uh, it might fail due to the environment. And uh, this is not your fault. This is not the people using the fault. But if, um, if you have a bath and you try to unlock your phone, now, or your phone, I don't know if you ever try it with these kind of fingers, <laughs> that's, not, that's not working. And that means probably it means that you should leave the bath by now. But, uh, that can also happen with faces. Um, this, this lady has uh, half the, the face illuminated, and the other one, it's very, very dark. Any face recognition or face verification algorithm will have a very, very hard time with that. And that happens a lot uh, even in, in outside on a very sunny days. This can happen a lot. And, um, and it's not her fault. It's not your fault either, because like, you don't have the data. But, uh, but it, you have to have a, a fallback mechanism that if that person is, doesn't want to go inside to access her bank account, which is quite legit, she ha you need to provide a second, uh, more traditional way for her to get in. Pros. Some modalities, not all of them, some modalities, especially iris, uh, retina, and DNA, are extremely secure, like really, really secure. So there's this example of, uh, I don't know if you remember this, this picture of National Ph uh, um, Geographic. That was uh, nine, I don't know, I have it later, so I will tell you the year. But they found the same person um, 18 years later. And how could they prove it was the same person? It, it was uh, Sherbat Gula. Well, they took two pictures of the, of the retina. Obviously, this was a professional picture, so it was a very high resolution. And on both of them, and looking at the, at the, not the retina, sorry, the iris, they could guarantee with 10 to the power minus 15 that that was the same person. Just to give you an idea, this number in, in positive, so this is 1 in 10 uh, power 15 that it was wrong. Um, that's 10,000 times the amount of people ever lived on Earth. So this is really secure. So coming back, somalities are extremely secure. And the key point here, it's more convenient for the user. And I'm going to highlight and bold it because that's the secret of biometrics. It's, it's, um, it's much harder to implement. It might be much harder to explain to the final user what's happening, why, why you cannot go to your bank account. In, while you're in the bathtub, but it is it can be more convenient in the long run for the most for most of the people. And just to highlight this convenience, there's a, a story going in the office. I'm going to pretend it's true. I'm not sure if it's true or not. But this is Dermot, uh, Dermot Desmond. This is the, I think it's the richest person in in Ireland, and he went to the pub one day, and he didn't have his wallet, and he couldn't get a pint. Like a person who owns an airport, London City Airport, he owned. Who could, he couldn't get a pint. So he was like, you know, I need something more convenient. So being rich, what you do, you become the founder, owner, and chairman of Down, who now has 11 offices across the world. By the way, two, two in, in, in Serbia, one in Belgrade and one in Novisa, 250 people. So that also shows you it's a hard problem because we are 250 working on that. But it also shows you that there's a market for this. 
And the thing is, like, it really becomes convenient. Like, if you are, uh, biometrics really well used are, are really nice. And this is only a, a very brief, uh, brief example of how to open a bank account uh, using um, <clears throat> biometrics. So first, you're prompted by the app to take a selfie. We are very good at taking selfies, some better than others. Second, uh, you are asked to provide some form of ID while you take a picture. And then the algorithm matches the tiny picture with the full picture, checks the same person, reads everything, you know, OCR, nothing, not, not, not black magic here, ask the user if it's okay with everything it read. If that's okay, boom, you have your bank account open in two minutes from your sofa, and, and that really highlights the, the, the convenience of, of biometrics. You can, you can allow people to prove their identity in a much more smoother and convenient way. And uh, I'm going to use convenient a lot in this talk, I think. So, okay, this is what it is, but how, how does it work? You know, what's, what's the black magic behind those things? So let's start with this gentleman. So imagine, like, uh, what, what you want to do is you need a function. And just, just this, this is the only slightly mathematical talk, uh, and words I'm going to use. You, go, you want a function, just the magic function that converts this image into a series of numbers. This series of numbers, just for the sake of explanation, we're going to say the first one is the distance between the eyes. So say there's a seven between the eyes. This is the whatever. 20 is the shape of the mouth. Like, you know, it's very round, so we put a 20. Four is how, how, how big the ears are. And 13 is, is, is I don't know, the shape of the nose, okay? So you measure those things in a way that when you come and you have a second picture, even if you're a bit fatter and you have glasses and, uh, and you know, Power makes you big, I guess. <laughs> if you, if you, through the same function, if you, 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 you want to convert this image into this feature of uh, feature vector, this, this series of numbers, that may need to be similar. You know, it doesn't need to be exact, but you want them to to become um, to to converge into the same point. So again, like. Distance between the eyes will be a 7, 21 will be the, the shape of the mouth. So it's not 20, but it's 21, it's not too bad, um, and so forth and so forth. And what you're doing with this is like, if you get these vectors, and imagine for a second they are in 2D because the screens are in 2D and it's easier to explain. If you put them on the feature space, that's a nice name, but that's basically, it's, it's those numbers in that uh, Euclidean space. You, they are going to be close because those, all those numbers are close to each other. So those two are going to be close to each other, those blue points. So when you come and that day you're very happy, you're showing your teeth, um, your eyes are closed, you have a complete different hairstyle, completely different lighting. This is actually similar to the lady we were seeing earlier. You can see very hard lighting from one side and dark in the other, so it's not that trivial you still want that function to get your numbers that are still close to what you had. So, so, th so that function really captured your essence and not the, your, your attire, your, your hair, or, or anything like that. And what is really important as well is like all these other people, when you pass them through the function, they are not going to be on the same place because you want them to be separated because he's going to be very, very angry if someone else shoots a nuclear missile and it's not him. <laughs> so what we can do if we have this function is like now we know that any image that th through that function ends in that place, that's going to be him. It's going to be our supreme leader. And that's, that's what we want. But the idea is about how do we get that function? And here is where machine learning comes in. So we use label data to train machine learning encoder or a model that's inter interchangeable or a function, actually. A function and model encoder, it depends on the public, it's the same thing. And that's what you do. You get like millions of images, actually, way more than the hundred you have here. You train your neural network and then to, to learn that function. And, and that's it. That's all the magic in, in face recognition. But again, like you need to tweak this function to make sure that each person will have its own re region, region on, the, on the feature space. Because if it doesn't work, if it doesn't work like this, it will not work, as I was explaining earlier. Um, face recognition is a problem virtually solved. This is uh, some of the rankings of uh, one of the hardest data sets of faces, like occlusions, very hard lighting. And you can see like all the top layers, like top eight is 99.7. 99.8, it, it's 
literally algorithms are much better than us at recognizing, recognizing faces, which is quite spectacular because, because humans, we have evolved to recognize faces. It's one of our huge abilities in the brain. So this is a problem virtually solved. So that's it. So I, you know, I'm gonna go. I create my company. I, I have, and basically, this is what my my algorithm, my my product is. I got a I got a picture of an angry man. I have a face detection, so I can crop it. So the algorithm, the the, the encoder, knows which part of the image are relevant. I compare it to my numbers. I check if it's the region I I expect it to be or not. If it's in the region I want it, it's it's the supreme leader. If not, it's not. That's it. Cool. So that's it. We have a good model. Are we ready to be rich? As you may expect, no. Because what happens when someone does this? <laughs> so this is what is called a spoof attack. You know, all of us have images of us on the on the internet. There's a gentleman there taking pictures of me that are going to be public. So you can go, take the picture, print it, or show it on your phone. You don't even have to use a printer. Show it to the app. And the app, he doesn't know like what a, what a basil of a mobile uh, of a, of a phone is. You know, he does not, doesn't have an idea what a printed document is or not. So, so the, the app probably will let you in. And again, like that's that's a printed uh, face. This is a face shown on a on a TV. It can be more sophisticated. You can like cut the eyes. It doesn't look very good to us, but this really tricks the algorithms because. The eyes are, uh, have a different material, obviously, because they are shiny. And a lot of algorithms look for this shininess, so you just cut it, put your own eyes, and then put you know, some wick and some glasses. And you know, this is really hard for an algorithm. And you can go even more complicated. It's just silicone mask. And I, it's, it's a matter of money. You know, like you can, I mean, you've all seen Hollywood movies or Serbian movies as well, you know, uh, with like, you know, fancy masks. To me, that looks like a person. Sincerely, I mean, it, it, it is a really hard problem, and it is so hard that uh, in 2017, iPhone had like this face verification, super duper. Took a week, less than a week, to a Malaysian team figure out that the specialized process area, 2D images of the eyes, silicon nose, 3D printed frame. You know, attackers can be very good at their job. It took less than a week, and boom, spoofed. All the news, all the bar rep, everything. Samsung, the same. Iris. I don't know if you remember, 2017, I think it was. Someone printed uh, uh, an image of a face and realized that by putting a contact lens on top of the eye, it will give this this, this change in the lighting in the in the that the algorithm will 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 think it's 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 the, the true person. Fingerprints that has been done for for many years, if not centuries. You just um, get a wax model. And then you just print it on silicone. I don't, I don't really, I, I have to confess, I don't know which material it is, but any material um, it could work. So it is a constant fight against the spoof attacks. So, so face verification and all biometrics in general, it's not about recognizing the person, it's about recognizing the person and making sure it's a live person. It's not a 2D printed, it's not something shown on TV and things like that. So, um, this is how we solve it. Um, can you tell me which of those images are a real a, a picture of a person and which ones are um, just reproductions, you know, printed or screens? I'm going to give you a hint. The square around them might be indicating something. <laughs> so the, one, the two on the left are original pictures. It's like if I take a picture of you. The other three, I think this is shown on a mobile phone, shown on a tablet and print it. Again, this is a really hard problem. So to tackle this, what we do is we use more machine learning. So we use real and spoof data, and this is the problem. We need the spoof data, because faces, you can go online, you can go on Facebook, you can, you can crawl it, you will have millions of faces. But how many pictures can you find on the internet of faces being shown on screen? So we need to create these data sets to train multiple machine learning models to detect spoofs. So we will train a, a model to detect silicon masks. So this is a simple model. This is a binary classifier. You give a, a, a bunch of images of faces, a bunch of images of, of masks. You don't show them like this. You show them like the ones before. Like you, you get these masks, you put them, you put the wig, you go outside, you take a picture, you go inside, you take another picture. You, you get hundreds, if not thousands, of pictures of silicon masks. 
you train your model, and then you have a model that will tell you if it's spoof or not, but only for silicon masks. Then you repeat the same for cut out, uh, cut out eyes on a mask. Again, you know, um, hundreds of, of printouts, you need to cut them, you need to put them, you need to put the wigs, different locations, etc., etc. thousands of images, you train another model. What about deepfakes? Why not? So you, again, you go there, you create deep fakes. So it's not that trivial. You, you, you create thousands of them, ten, tens of thousands of them even, and, and you create a model, the same for a screen replace, etc., etc., etc. And this is a lot of work. This is a lot of data. And, but at the end, how the real face verification algorithms, and this is, I'm, I'm, I'm putting an example with face verification, but that could be with any other modality, voice, for instance, like, you know, how do you know it's you talking and it's not like a replay that I just recorded secretly while we were somewhere else. And what it, what it is, is the same. You get a face, you cut it, then you have like a battery of very complex models, uh, machine learning models, that they all check that this image is of a real person. And when you're sure this image is of a real person, then you do a feature extraction and then you get your, um, your final decision. So in summary, I think I'm on time. Biometric verification can make authentication more convenient. And I'm sure all of you or most of you will use already some form of biometric authentication, fingerprints, face on the mobile, things like that. However, this is a constant race between spoofers and anti-spoofers. And this is also actually something quite interesting because you can get, you can put away your white hat, get the black hat and think like, think like how can I break the system? And that can be a lot of fun sometimes. And then it, it's a constant race. You need, you need to, to, to think as a spoofer will think in order to create the data set so your models have the data to learn to prevent this person getting in. And as I was saying, uh, the, the way to win this race is, is to use data. Um, data, 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 data. I hope my boss is looking at this presentation. Data. <laughs> A lot of them. Uh, just to give you an idea, from the 250 employees, we have 16, I think, at the moment, only creating data. There are nearly as many or more, I don't know, I don't know the numbers now, but like 50% of the research team is creating data and 50% is, is people using that data for models. It's super, super important. If you want to join that race, this is all the openings we have, some of them in Serbia. Um, so you can check the website, uh, you're, you will uh, find that online. And that's me, so thank you very much. And if you have uh, any question, <laughs>